So these are a couple of things that we can actually take into consideration when we think web video in education and learning. So what I want to say here is, it's interesting, I still haven't gone to the video yet, have I? Keep it coming, Jonathan, keep it coming. <laughs> we can do more than just create television. We can do a whole lot more than just create television. We can actually exploit new media characteristics to create a far more holistic learning experience. And of course, knowledge is power. Learning is able to empower people to be far more effective uh, members of a democratic society, which I think, if I'm right in understanding your goals uh, here, these sorts of things will actually help you. So how do we do it? We've got to get down to some practical stuff. We don't want to be all airy-fairy. Well, let's draw first of all on television grammar. And grammar is just a set of rules that we follow. Grammar are like road rules, only grammar we're saying to television, make good television. And I want to throw a couple of these things. These are just a couple of sort of, um, uh, a couple of sort of common bits of grammar in television. We say we should actually never have a jump cut. A jump cut is where you edit from one frame to another and it sort of looks like they've jumped, okay? Or maybe you've done a shoot of somebody walking through the door. Uh, if we can imagine there is a door at the back, we haven't locked that door, should we do that? No? Lunch might be smelling through the door perhaps? No? If I could actually take the photograph of me walking out that door, uh, a video uh, shot of me walking out that door, and then put the camera on the other side and then watch me walk through the door from that perspective, just say I did it today and tomorrow. I've got to make sure I'm wearing the right clothes, otherwise it creates discontinuity. So these are the sorts of grammar issues that we need to actually be very aware of when it comes to uh, creating television. No jump cuts, continuity. The same thing with an eye line. The way the brain works actually uh, is, is very regular. Once again, going back to mental models and patterns and so forth, our brain sort of packages and categorises everything so that we can more easily understand. If we didn't sort of package things in <coughs> mental models, we'd have to spend a lot more time understanding information. So our brain sort of almost pigeonholes things. If I'm doing an interview on television, I'm interviewing maybe the, uh, let's say, the President of the United States, and I'm interviewing um, Blix, the weapons inspector. These are two big people in uh, the news today. Well, if I'm actually to interview both of them, I would actually put both of them on separate sides of the screen, because that's how you actually watch a conversation. If I had just one side of the screen, Bush on this side of the screen, and Blix on that side of the screen, it would actually be quite unnatural and quite difficult to go backwards and forwards. So it's understanding television grammar, we need to drag that over to the web. But as it's already been highlighted, that causes some problems. And the problems are actually caused because we have technical limitations. Don't pan or zoom. Because at the moment, most people are actually watching on a 56 kilobit modem. Um, that means that we have to um, be conscious of very little data. Now, if you're not aware of bandwidth and broadband, what we're talking about here is the bigger the picture, the better quality of the picture, the more pixels, the more dots you have to actually send down the tube to actually have it rendered on the screen. Um, that means you need a big tube or big bandwidth. And at the moment, most people don't. So these are the limitations we have. Don't pan or zoom, because moving backgrounds require more data to be streamed at the one time. That means doing things like putting a camera on a tripod You've all seen those dreadful home videos, haven't you, where someone's taking a shot and it's wobbly? <laughs> well, the problem with a wobbly backdrop means there's actually more information to scroll, uh, to stream. So make sure that you put it on a tripod. Avoid long shots. If I take a photograph of a lot, and it's a long shot, the person, or the subject of that photograph, is actually going to be like a little stick insect. You're not actually going to see them. And this is one of the, the clear differences <coughs> I've noticed in, in amateur photography. It is still photography level, like just images. Um, when amateurs take photographs, they try to take the whole picture, don't they? And actually, when they take the whole picture, they do get the whole picture, but they don't get what they're after. And actually, zooming in and framing in is fundamental to actually telling your story. Because if you don't frame in, you've got a lot more distractions to worry about, and you're actually not actually focusing in on the person that you're, you're, you're uh, focused on. So we looked at the technical limitations, but there are also some technical possibilities. You can chunk your material and package it in a non-linear way. That's learner centred, remember? If we go back to that learner centred bit. And we can also use multiple storytelling tools. What sort of, sort of storytelling tools do we have? We've got video, and that's what you're using primarily. But you're on the internet. You don't just have to use video. 
I surprised a conference. I was uh, speaking in New York, uh, New York last month, and I actually said to a group of video, uh, video web producers, I said, you've got permission not to use video, because sometimes video won't actually work for you. You can use text. You can use still images. You can use diagrams. You can use audio. You can just about use everything on the, air, uh, on the net. And these different storytelling tools have different strengths. One of the most uh, tragic bits of television footage, but also one of the most powerful, was the aeroplane flying into the uh, second tower of the World Trade Center. And that sends shivers down my spine every time I see it. And you know, it doesn't matter how good you are at writing, whether you're writing prose or poetry, you will never catch the emotion and the tragedy of that one, f uh, that one uh, shot uh, in text. It won't work. Video is the best way to use it. If I'm going to explain to you how a steam engine works, it will take you paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of text. If I use a flash animation, I could actually do it to you in about 30 seconds, and you would probably understand how a steam engine works. So by understanding the different storytelling tools that we've got, we can actually make our communication far more effective, far more quicker, and create far more power in helping people understand our message. So when you think video, don't just think, I'm going to shoot this video. Think also about other storytelling elements that you can include, like diagrams and photographs. And uh, it was interesting to note uh, the question that came up in the conference earlier this morning that was asked in Polish, um, and, I, and I, I hope I got the interpretation right through the English version, was what about people interacting with content? Well, this is what's exciting about the web, because you can actually have your audience creating content through chat sites uh, uh, and, and message boards and so forth, just like they would create content in a classroom situation. So interactivity um, enables you to bring more people into the, sphere, into the sphere of learning, as well as giving them more control over what they receive. So use these as well. <coughs> and as I said, use communities such as message boards or live chat. Um, after all, as I say, class dialogue, class dialogue is a great way to learn. You can do it in a community. But I want to say one major thing, and I, I'm really <laughs> excited to hear Jerry make, make a similar comment on this one. Because I always have wars with the technical people, always. Because I'm a journalist, I come from a storytelling background. Uh, and in fact, I don't know the gadgets. Uh, I don't know XML, I don't know how to write JavaScript code, but I know how to tell the story, I think. But. <coughs> What happens is the internet world at the moment is being uh, moved in a way that it's in serious danger of being duped by gadgets. I was asked to, and I do a lot of brainstorming sessions with producers, they say, Jonathan, can you come in and help us develop some ideas for our website? So I went to this one, it was actually teaching languages. And a group of people sitting around a table drinking coffee uh, and uh, eating biscuits and coming up with an idea of how to teach languages online. And there was a guy in the corner, a Spanish guy in fact, and he kept saying, um, Jonathan, um, we've got to use video, we've got to use video, we've got to use video. It was like a broken record. We've got to use video, we've got to use video. It probably won't help at all. And that's where we need to actually look at other storytelling tools. Don't get hooked on your device. Keep asking yourself, what storytelling tool will better help this person learn? And be focused on your story, to, on your, on your story or your purpose or whatever you're trying to get across. Some tips, let's, go to, let's get down to some practical realities here. Visualise your audience. As I said, how old are they? What generation are they in? Uh, I think uh, if I remember the earlier demographics were that a lot of younger people are coming onto your site. Well, start using some metaphors. You probably already are, but use lots of metaphors that they can relate to. You know, talk about uh, things that are interesting then. Uh, if it's an older group of people coming to your site, relate to their sense of history and shared experiences. That will make your message more powerful and clarify your purpose. One of the biggest problems in any media uh, production, whether it be TV, radio, print or whatever, is people often aren't clear on their purpose. What are you trying to do? Now, go beyond saying, I'm just trying to educate people. Go beyond that and say, I'm trying to educate people to learn a language. Or I'm trying to persuade people to quit smoking. Whatever you are doing, be so specific so you've got something to hang every bit of content on your site. When you decide to run a piece of video footage, you say, does this help people give up, or does this persuade people for, uh, to stop smoking? If it doesn't, don't use it. Be really cutthroat. The more cutthroat you are, the more powerful your presentation will be. 
check every bit of content. <laughs> it's like in a sentence, when I write something, I go through every sentence and I look at every word and I say, if I take the word out of this sentence, will it change the meaning? If it changes the meaning, keep it in. If it doesn't, blow it away. Forget it. And it's the same with pictures, video, whatever else. Because our focus is not on actually being video people, it's not on being internet practitioners, it's actually on helping people learn things. Scripted presentation. Um, I think in my notes that I handed out, I told you that even the most professional TV presenters are often really nervous about doing live presentations. Script it, you've got more control. And script it. Spend a third of your time actually writing a script. I have a thing called the 33 rule. 33% 33 of your time must be spent in planning it. And when you plan your script, don't write it like Shakespeare would write it. Okay, forget Shakespeare, he was good. But we're in the new media world now. Modularize it, break it into chunks so that you can actually stop and start, stop and start all the way through. So if there's a chunk of information that somebody already knows, um, they can grab it. They, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't need to have to go through everything. And the way things are going these days, um, and, and forgive me because I don't know your culture well enough, I have to keep coming back to Poland and learn, but certainly in, the, in, 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 in the English speaking countries, we are consumer driven, um, and it's everything about, I want this and I want it now. Now that's the culture people are in, and learning is starting to follow that culture as well. I want to learn this, I don't want to learn that. So we need to actually package it in a way that will actually help them, because if we do, they'll keep coming back and using our media. Integrate different storytelling tools, as I said. Sometimes a picture will be far better. A picture, uh, as the, uh, the saying goes, a picture tells a thousand words. But it's not always clear. If I'm running a news story and I show the photograph of the tail of an aircraft, it could be an aircraft strike, it could mean 3,000 people are being sacked, it could mean airport delays, it could mean all sorts of things. But I know pretty quick we're talking about the airline industry. A caption underneath it saying, 3,000 sacked is actually going to clarify the meaning. So actually draw together different storytelling modes to help understand it. That means using Astons on your video, you know, the little titles underneath. I'm always frustrated by news and current affairs programs that use an Aston, and that is that little thing saying, Dr. Joe Bloggs, expert on nuclear physics. Um, and then halfway through the program, they forget to actually use that Aston. And if I come in halfway through that program, I've got no idea who this guy is. Can I trust him? Is he an expert? Make it easy for people to, uh, to, to follow. Get a picture to help tell the story. Yep. Uh, structure your presentation logically and in modules so it's not linear. Repeat important points. Remember I talked about that one? It's, uh, you know, Frida Mary John, Frida Mary John, Frida Mary John. I remember their names. If you get people to keep going over content in their heads, they will remember it. But the question is, you're saying, Jonathan, that's really patronising. I'm not going to get them to keep saying it over and over again, but you can be exciting in the way you do it. You can show it from a visual perspective. You can use text to reinforce it. You can actually have people discussing it in a chat room. All these things actually reinforce it. The cognitive uh, science tells us it's all about moving information backwards and forwards between our long and short term memories and so forth. Now if we're actually getting them to do that, that will help them retain it. We could use quizzes. In Britain people love quizzes. I don't know if you guys in your culture enjoy quizzes, but at the end of, um, end of a presentation you might actually do a quick quiz. Uh, how much do you actually remember? Or what do you think? And go through and you can actually score them. They're very, very powerful things. Final comments, the grammar is still emerging. Okay. We don't know what is right and wrong, but we've got some ideas. If we centre what we're doing on storytelling values, drawing a bit from traditional television storytelling and then adding the new media elements to it, there's a good chance we'll be quite successful. But be prepared to push the boat out. Go and try a few things. Look, get on really good terms with your boss so you can talk them into doing something you think might flop, but it might also succeed. Give it a go. Be daring because we don't know what works and doesn't, doesn't work. As I said, we've had three years of web access to the broad community, but guess what? It's changed over that three years. Three years ago, the actual quality of video and audio was not very good. It's getting better and better. So actually, we don't have a fixed medium in which we can say we've got a set of values. Bottom line, you're coming up with the values and the grammar. You're pioneering this. You've got to keep trying things that work, but keep centering on storytelling values.
So you can pioneer and lead the way because there are all sorts of exciting possibilities. And I want to say good luck because pretty well um, it's really up to you guys. I've got half an hour, you know, I had half an hour to, to talk to you. But the bottom line is to go through a lot of what we've got, I would usually spend a week with people throwing ideas around in a workshop and pushing and pushing and pushing and challenging what they've got to say and trying to help them come through with nice new ideas so they can actually learn these approaches. Um, all I'm doing here is being able to give you an opportunity to think through some of these issues and try it because, gosh, you've got so much potential. And I, and I to be quite honest, when I came over here last night, I was stuck on, that, on, the, on the aircraft. I had a screaming brat sitting behind me on the aircraft. I hate that. You know when you're trying to read a book and the baby behind keeps screaming? And frankly, I was thinking, gosh, now what am I going to do? I'll just do a quick whiz around in half an hour. Will I actually sit in the conference now? I'll go and find a bar and drink and then come and do my little talk. That's what a lot of people do, you see. But listening to what was outlined and what you've got, there is so much exciting potential. And if you harness this, you're not just influencing Poland, you're influencing the world because you're not just in Poland. You've got everybody in the world accessing your information. And I'm going to finish by actually telling a story. Um, last year, um, a group of... Uh, a group of people from my church went across to Cuba and I was with them and, and we went to Havana um, and I was really excited about Havana because I love cigars. <laughs> I get the Cuban cigars cheap. Actually, it's cheaper to buy Cuban cigars in Andorra than it is in Havana, just to let you know if you go for a trip to Havana, don't expect cheap cigars. Um, unless you want to buy the ones that fell off the back of a truck and they're cheap, but you have to work hard to get those. But in Havana, um, we were in a, a little town, a little shanty town, we probably shouldn't have been there, but I met uh, a guy who had been a, an official in Fidel Castro's, uh, 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 one of his uh, offices, or in terms of one of his departments and so forth, and no longer there. And um, he told us how, in the space of six months, he lost about four members of his family. They all died. Four members of the family. And the fifth member of the family was also dreadfully ill. And uh, uh, when, when, when his wife went, uh, she, you know, it, it, was, it was absolutely catastrophic. Um, and through a process of about 25, 35 minutes, he told us how he went, descended into alcoholism, and then he went into the occult, and then finally he had some other sort of spiritual transformations and ended up in the church. Now, the bottom line was that this was the most moving story I've ever heard. And when you actually look somebody in the eye and they connect with you, and you can see the pain, the terror, and the absolute hardship they went through firsthand, that really affects you. It really, really affects you. And when you actually find out the way in which they've overcome all the odds and they've become really, really, uh, really, really sort of responsible and helpful these days and they're back on track, it's really exciting. But that guy did not talk to me in English. And I don't understand Spanish. <laughs> I understand enough Spanish, I <laughs> remember some great Spanish conversations using my hands. <laughs> Well, that guy was actually telling us his story via a translator. Incidentally, the translator wasn't very good. And what was even worse about the translator was he kept getting hooked on the story and losing track. Why? Because it was a powerful story. The translation was crap. It was bad. It was awful. It was just not up to scratch. But five of us were craning our necks trying to hear this guy's story. Because actually, we love stories, don't we? And that's what people are all about. We're interested in connecting with others by actually telling stories. And even though everything went wrong, the usability in that conversation was stuffed. It was bad because we could hardly understand the language. <coughs> we still connected and we still wanted to listen. And that is actually what is going to drive us in any production um, area. The fact that people do want to hear our content, the stories that we tell. And the better we tell them, the more powerful they'll be. But at the end of the day, it's a story that will actually drive. And a few years ago, they talked about content is king. That was a phrase, the buzz phrase. A friend of mine in Australia says content is queen. She reckons more women produce internet sites than men, so she said it should be content is queen. <laughs> but content is king, and that's what drives us, and that's what we've got to be focused on. But we also must know our technology so we can use it as well as we can to actually powerfully tell our stories. Doctor Who is a science fiction type show and they stopped producing it on television but anybody in Britain you talk to will tell you they grew up with Doctor Who. And by using Smile, they've actually gone on and actually created a radio drama, okay, using text and, and audio is very good because you can change the quality of your voice and get tonality and so forth. Um, and actually used, it, uh, used 
the SMILE presentation to integrate pictures and text. Now, will this be connected as well? We'll get sound on this. Okay, so we're just connecting. This is a live connection. Usually when we do demonstrations, they don't work. Let's see what happens. It's loading. <laughs> Yourself. There is a rent in time. What is the cause? You hardly seem the type to be concerned about the fate of the universe. I don't know who you are or why you ask, but if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. Then you will die. Let me stop at that point then. Isn't it interesting? You get some of the tonality of the actual audio, don't you? You can close your eyes and you can almost see what's going on. But the picture, this shadow here, for instance, and even before the shadow, um, the, the, the sort of like the photograph or the actual drawing of that uh, evil man give you half the story. You see, we're actually, we're actually being quite powerful the way we're using these storytelling tools. I'll leave that there behind because that was quite a, uh, an important uh, development for us at the BBC. It was something we hadn't done before that we started developing. This thing here is actually um, uh, one year uh, on from the uh, tragedy of September 11, or 9 11 as it's uh, referred to in the US. And what we have here is we're actually using. Um, a non-linear uh, approach to telling this story. Now, you could watch a half-hour television show uh, about uh, September 11 and, and, and uh, the first impact and what happened in Washington and towers collapsing and the whole bit, but you actually have to watch it from the beginning to the end. What if you actually only want to watch a little bit of that? Well, by modularising your content, you can actually skip around. And this is a perfect example of non-linearity. So here we are, we've got the anniversary. Um, see here, and you can see I've actually got text that I'm, I'm reading from here. The United States has been reflecting on the devastating attacks by terrorists on September 11 last year, Jane Powell. Now, if I actually want to see this, I can actually watch it. So we're going to now uh, watch this over here on the side. Technology is getting better and better, and loading won't take so long in the future. We've also got checks down in the lower part of the screen too, as yes, you can see there, September 11 remembered. If they ran the current version of the server, it would fix it. Okay, so we've got some slow speed here on the bandwidth. Music to celebrate the lives of ordinary people, the 2,800 victims of the September the 11th attacks on New York, those on the two aircraft which sliced into the Twin Towers, the people working inside the World Trade Center, and those who tried to rescue them. What we're going to do is we'll go across here and look at the world leader reactions. And this is what we're talking about in an eternal storytelling environment. We can do this for education. Here we go. We'll be selling popcorn in the interval. <laughs> Full horror of what has happened in the United States earlier today is now becoming clearer. It is hard even to <coughs> contemplate the utter carnage and terror which has engulfed so many innocent people. I can go straight to the actual... We've offered to see the footage there. President Bush and the American people... This is, in fact, our what solidarity is all about. And by actually happened. structuring our own learning content in this way, people can direct at their own pace the learning modules in their own way. They can also entertain communities by chatting online and so forth as they go through it. Back in New York at 
10 o'clock, barely an hour after it was hit, the South Tower collapsed. I the whole the building has collapsed. The building has collapsed. That's the southern tower you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. The second building that we witnessed the airplane enter. The intense heat bent the steel, and as one floor collapsed onto the one below, the whole structure crumpled, crushing many emergency workers. I'm going to leave that behind just as a, as, a, as a last example. And you get an idea, I've got other examples, you get an idea. Once again, we can actually create content that you can navigate or your user can actually be at the center of. I might leave at that point because I think, I think what's my time, is that right? Yeah. It's okay. Cool. Do you want to see another example? No? Yeah, well, you, 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 it's okay. I'll show you one very quick one. Uh, and this is, this is probably more important for, for UK audiences. So this is simply uh, the Queen Mother, in fact. Jerry said, uh, real is constantly developing and taking it further and further. Now this is quite a poor picture. And unfortunately, there's too much detail in this picture to, to make it really successful. But in the future, if we utilize this, we can do really some powerful things. Await ladies of the royal household. And members of Queen Elizabeth Star and also at Westminster Hall. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting. So you get the idea, once again, skipping around. So you can do all sorts of things, taking traditional video to an even greater level to, uh, to help through interactivity and, uh, and to help learning. And there we go. Good luck. <laughs>